right. Are you scared? <laughs> well, I hope you are. Um, so let me first introduce myself and Peter as well. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'll be giving you the first half of this presentation. And I'm the member of the Drupal security team and been working with Drupal for a couple of years, so hopefully have enough experience with it. Uh, Peter, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Peter Willinen, uh, also on the Drupal security team. We're, we've been doing these sorts of talks, you know, among different members of the team as sort of a public service to try to get uh, at least an overview in people's minds of what important topics in Drupal security are that you should be thinking about, especially as a developer, as a themer. Um, some of the other uh, DrupalCons, we've had talks also more focused at site administrators, um, but we didn't get, get one uh, this time. So uh, it's really, this is an overview to give you the concepts. Um, you're not gonna learn everything you need to know, but hopefully you'll, you'll learn the key, key phrases and things to look for later and things to think about. Um, and it's gonna and get you interested enough so you learn more about what security really means. Yeah, so as Peter said, this is really going to be an overview, and I wanted to start by talking about um, why, why should you even care about security. And security is pretty important, and if you take a look at the history of what was happening before and what's happening now, if you take a look at, I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the real start of the public internet as we know it, security was really fun. It was something that people did because they were interested in it. It was really hacking, trying to find holes in systems. While right now, it's, it's something else. It's a, it's a business, and it's a multi-billion dollar business that's focused on all of you guys. And it does a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, it affects your good name, uh, but on, not only that, it, it affects your revenue, your margins, you know, it affects everything that you, that you do online. And as, uh, as you pointed out, it also can affect your customers because if somebody hacks your site and puts something there, uh, it's not only you know, endangering you and your business, but it's also endangering everybody who comes to the site. If you will be, for example, share, uh, you know, uh, serving some malware or spyware on your site. So it's also important for your customers. And um, what I saw when I did this talk for the first time uh, in a different format. This is, by the way, the first time we're using Prezi, so it might be fun. Um, people said, well, you know, my site is not important, uh, but in the end, every site is important, no matter who, who, who you are. Maybe you have a site for your family uh, that, you know, your family accesses once a month. Then you don't, probably don't want to be serving malware to your family. And at the same time, if you're, I don't know, PayPal, then you're important because your site is so large that people will attack you no matter what. So I'm pretty sure that uh, PayPal is constantly in, under some attacks. So um, one thing I wanted to talk about is that Drupal security, uh, especially in Drupal, is not just about that. Uh, and we have some customers like that that come to us and say, I want a web application firewall because I want to be sure of security. This is just not enough. And it's some kind of layer that you can add, but it's like a reassurance. In Drupal, it works, um, it works a little bit differently because Drupal security is based on layers and is basically bound to everything that you do in Drupal. So, for example, take a look at menu and node access. And by menu and node access, you control who accesses your nodes, who can access your administration interface, for example. Or when you pass that, basically, because you have access to some administration interface, you come to Form API, and Form API makes sure that you are protected against cross-site request forgery, which we will talk about later. Um, then you go to the next step, and you have Database API to make sure that you're protected against something like SQL injection, for example. And as a last step, and it's probably the most important one, it's on the top of the list, uh, is the theming layer, or you can say rendering, rendering layer that takes care of all the functions that, for example, output some user input and take care of cross-site scripting. So that's Drupal security in layers, and it's very important to understand that it's not just about cross-site scripting, it's all about, the all about all the layers that you have. So um, before we talk a bit more in detail about uh, the stuff we came here to do, uh, coding, uh, one important thing and a few other things that I will show you, and one of them is keep up to date. 
please update your modules, please, you know, don't forget about it. It's very important. And Drupal is trying to make this as easy as possible for you. So there's an update module that will send you an email if, the, if there's any secure update, a security update for your, for your site and you just go to the update module settings and set it up there. Or there's, um, if you go to drupal.org, I'm sure all of you have drupal.org uh, account, in your user profile you can, uh, you can uh, subscribe to all security announcements. So whenever a security team uh, like Greg over here uh, uh, announces some kind of vulnerability that's in, the, in any code and any fix, you will receive an email that something's happening. And at the same time, it's very important to have some kind of method how you update your site, uh, because whatever you, if you do FTP or if you do Git or if you do subversion or anything else, be consistent, you know, choose your methods, create some kind of procedure and stick to, stick to it. If you do it differently all the time, it's going to be difficult for you. So let's talk about checklists. And I like checklists because uh, um, I've seen some research from uh, medical surgeries when they actually found out that if they do a quick checklist at the start of the surgery and the same checklist at the end of the surgery, the, the amount of problems that arise from the surgery uh, lowers significantly. And they found out that uh, they actually leave the tools in your stomach far too often. And so they just do a checklist, you know, knives, you know, retractor or anything else. And at the end of the surgery, they do the same to make sure they didn't leave in any tools inside you. So that's why I like checklists because it really works. So a couple of you know, very quick rules that we usually say uh, to users. Please do, 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 do not use PHP filter. And at the same time, you know, it's very important to know what's the concept of text filters and what's the concept of uh, full HTML and fill to HTML. And don't let anyone who's not trusted have full, full HTML access. Um, what's also important, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that actually on most of the problems that we found, uh, that we find are in custom theme and templates. It's not in the custom code because it's very easy to do it with custom modules. Okay, let me clarify that. So that's if you do a site audit. So if you go out and look at real production sites that someone has built and deployed, you look at Drupal.org, obviously most of the vulnerabilities that we publish are in modules, but there are many, many more modules on Drupal.org than themes. So, so this is this statement, and we're gonna, you know, uh, come back to a few times and just reemphasize: is as you, as a site developer, with your custom theme that no one else is looking at, that's not published on Drupal.org, that's where the vulnerability is most, yeah. most likely to occur. Absolutely, and you know, in the end, use APIs. Whatever the Drupal API is, once you start going beyond APIs in Drupal, it's a very big chance you're doing something wrong. And when in doubt, check plane. You know, write it down on your monitor or on your screen. In doubt, check plane. So um, let's talk a bit more about uh, the types of problems that are usually found in Drupal. And this is a very nice chart uh, from the Drupal Security Report that shows uh, a breakdown of, uh, of problems for both core and contrib from 2005 to 2010. And you can see it's really sticking out. Cross-site scripting is the most popular, if you could say popular one, uh, in all the modules that, uh, that are on Drupal.org. Um, and it's a bit different from what you can find in other, other frameworks, uh, because we, we have found out that other frameworks usually have SQL injection as the most dominant one. But apparently the Drupal database API is so good that people don't have too many problems with it. So cross-site scripting is the most important one. So um, let's focus on three main problems that you can find in uh, a lot of Drupal modules and then one of my favorites as well. So um, the first one, SQL injection. What is very important about SQL injection is that it's really bad. You know, um, if there's a problem that is exploitable in some, in some module on Drupal.org, uh, the Drupal security team usually uh, does a security announcement that's highly critical. So once it's a, a scale injection that's exploitable, it's always high, highly critical. And it's important to know. Um, and so what does a scale injection mean? Imagine some code of 
some code that looks like this. You know, it selects something from a table where ID, or that could be a node ID, for example, equals to some argument. Um, you probably know the function at the end, that's argument one, that means some ki kind of argument from, from that's coming from a URL usually. So this is okay, you know, uh, you say argument is one, two, three, it will give you some data for a node one, two, three. But imagine what happens if the argument is actually one or one equals one. This will all be passed to the SQL server and it will say one or equals one equals one, which is true. So that will mean that it will return all the data that's in the table instead of the one node that you are, research, that you are interested in. So, and it's, it's, it's like a very simple example, but you talked about uh, some very- Yeah, so I mean this looks, you might say, well, why does that matter? You know, why does it matter if someone can you know, access a piece of content they're not supposed to? Um, well, there's a couple things. First off, imagine your site has some access control on nodes. So a very easy example there, they you know, are able to bypass the access control and see content that they're not supposed to see. Um, depending on your business, that might be actually a, re a really big problem. Um, the um, other thing is that you can use these sort of select queries um, in combination with a union to pull data from other tables. And an example that should scare you in Drupal 6, uh, we haven't yet finished backporting a patch that we hardened in Drupal 7 um, against stealing the data necessary to generate a one-time login link. So if you had this sort of injection in Drupal 6, you could pull out all the pieces necessary and generate a one-time login link for any user on that Drupal 6 site. Yeah, just out of curiosity, does anyone know what the data necessary to generate a user, uh, the one-time login is? It's uh, the last login time. Yeah. It's the username and password, I think. The hash password, yeah. Hash password, and that's, and altogether it makes an MD5 hash. That's the, the unique string that you see in the one-time login link. So using SQL injection, you can almost very easily uh, get all this data out of the database and then generate your own one-time login link, and then you're done. Yeah. Sure, so, so yeah, just to re repeat the, the comment, clearly it's more dangerous and more obviously dangerous if this is a delete statement. So um, where someone was deleting data and you could delete something that they didn't mean to delete. Yeah, absolutely, it's much, much easier if you just uh, right. Put but delete instead of select, and then it will say delete yeah. everything from table where right. ID equals true. But well, the, most, true. the most common injection we see, though, is a select injection like this. So the other thing I, I, I just want to point out is this arg is pulling something from the URL, and we're going to get back later to what um, user input is. So think about what you know. We basically, you might think the URL is something fixed that the browser goes to from a link, but in fact, it's user input. And that's an yeah. important concept to. Think about where user input is entering the system. Absolutely. So how to fix this? Uh, this is valid for Drupal 7. It's a bit different in Drupal 6, but we are all, all on Drupal 7 for the past year, so this should be the most valid. So just to fix the, the query that we talked about before, basically you use placeholders in your queries instead of the user input. So if you want to do the argument, uh, you basically say where ID is higher or equals and then colon ID, for example. And then as a second argument to the DB query function, you pass the argument as the placeholder. And this will make sure that the database layer will escape all of the data so nothing can happen. And at the same time, uh, the Drupal 7 has the new database, the new generation API that allows you to make queries as objects instead of writing SQL queries if you're, for example, not comfortable with writing SQL queries. You just write objects like this. So, uh, for example, this code will generate something like insert into node, uh, title, UID created, and all these values. So this database layer does all the stuff that we talked about automatically. So you just say db insert, and then the ID or created equals to the argument. And the database layer will automatically detect what the column type is, and how does it have to ex escape it? Yeah. Okay. Just as, as a side note, and yeah, you may run into this, all, the escaping is done as strings. So in Drupal 6, you could sometimes get away with passing 
a Boolean use. value into something that was supposed to be an integer column, and it would work. But uh, that won't work in Drupal 7, just from, from hard one experience, I can tell you. <laughs> because if you escape a, escape a string that's false, you get an empty string rather than getting zero. Yeah, so let's talk about cross-site scripting. You know, if there's something you take away from this presentation, it's this. So take attention because that's the most important one that we see so often that it's just not good. Um, what's important about uh, cross-site scripting is that you are taking some user input and escaping it on output. Um, and that's very important, especially in Drupal. So imagine you get some kind of, I don't know, username from the user or notes title and you save it to the database. And once you save it to the database, you actually don't care about cross-site scripting. You only start caring once you display the notes title to the user. And the reason is that when you are saving the data, you don't know what's the context of the data. So you might be displaying the notes title in XML, you might be displaying it as HTML, and the context is different. And for example, in XML, you escape it differently. And that's a very important concept. And um, once you get the presentation, there's a great article from Stephen Wittens um, that, that he wrote about safe string theory for the web. And it talks about this concept, and I definitely encourage you to read about, uh, read about this. And um, what's very important, again, is the user input. And just out of curiosity, uh, let's do some kind of poll you know, about user input. What do you think user input is? So let's say notes title that you know, you're a content administrator, you write a notes title, is that a user input? Raise your hand if you think so. Great, yes it is. Username, for example, or password? Yeah, what about a URL, like the note ID? Great, and have you thought about, let's say, user agent? Less hands, but it's important. So, you know, sorry? Hidden fields, yeah. Um, very important, you know, every time a browser requests a page, it sends headers, and the headers are user agent, uh, the language is supported, uh, the refer, and a lot of other stuff. That's user input as well. And uh, you talked about, what was the module that had some problem with the user agent? I think this is maybe Greg's module. The <laughs> <laughs> no, with the, the header. Yeah, so, um, co-maintainer, anyway, so, I don't remember the name of the module offhand, but ba basically what this module do did was log, uh, I think, the user agent strings. So you could see, for example, you want to see how many people are using, you know, the iPhone, how many people are using uh, Safari on the Mac. You know, it's logging that and it put it in the log message uh, every time the user visited the site. Well, someone discovered that this module was not actually um, escaping that. It was not treating it as unsafe user input. So someone could, in fact, using command line tools, you could very easily write a different kind of header there that's actually a uh, JavaScript. And so when you went to view your log messages, actually the JavaScript would execute as a cross-site scripting attack. Yeah, uh, so anything that's coming from the browser, whatever it is, is user input and cannot be trusted. You cannot trust anything that's coming from the user no matter what. So again, just to give you an example, imagine this very simple code, print, Hello, notes title. So it will print the notes title, but imagine if the notes title is actually coming some kind of JavaScript, and that's a user input, so I write a, write a JavaScript. And what it will do is print hello, and then the JavaScript code into HTML. And this JavaScript code will be ran on the user browser, and that means that the, the JavaScript can do almost anything. And if you can do it, JavaScript can do it better, which is something we'll show you. Right, an important point of that is the JavaScript is running on the site, and if people know anything about browser security, there's a, a security policy called the same origin policy. So that, that means JavaScript running on someone else's site is not allowed to operate on your site. But if the JavaScript is coming from your site, that JavaScript has basically full access to everything that you have access to. So that, that's an important distinction. That's why cross-site scripting is dangerous because of that same origin policy, if the JavaScript originates from your site, then that JavaScript has the same access that you have. Mm -hmm. So how to fix this? Um, this is a great uh, This is a great picture, again, from Greg. Uh, I don't know why he does so much stuff. Um, 
imagine that the stuff you see, that's the user input. So you basically come from the top and you basically decide in your code if the stuff that came from the user is a URL. Then there's a function in Drupal that's called check URL and you should use it on any URL you print from the user. And it will make sure that, for example, the protocol is correct, so it's like HTTP, HTTPS, or it's just a valid protocol. It will make it actually, I think, H X HTML compliant, so it will replace all ampersands with the, the uh, with ampersand and uh, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then if it's, if it's not a URL, maybe it's a plain text. Uh, so it's a notes title. Notes title is usually plain text. And this is basically what you are doing yourself when you are coding all your modules. And if it's a plain text, there's a function that I talked about earlier that's called check plain. So when in doubt, check plain. It's ran almost everywhere in Drupal core. And maybe the code is rich text, so it's coming from a Vesivic, for example. So uh, it's the body of the node or something like that. Then there's a function in Drupal called check markup. And the check markup function, you probably know um, who, do you know the concept of text filters or input filters in Drupal? Raise your hand. Almost everybody? Great. Um, so the check markup function, one of the arguments for the function is actually the input filter that you need to use. So the check markup function will filter the text based on this text format. And important to note there that Check markup is the kind of thing you don't want to use very often in custom code because you don't have any guarantee that it's going to make the string safe. Because someone can reconfigure the text format and make it unsafe. Um, for example, allowing through different, you know, a script tag in that format. Yeah, because uh, if somebody does full HTML for the input format, then check markup does almost nothing, for example. So it's really for stuff where you know it's really rich text. So, and if it's an HTML, you know, if it's rich text, then you use check markup because you don't really know what formats you want or what format did the user want. There's also a function called filter XSS, which is actually usually called by check markup uh, if you use the filtered HTML text format. And that will make sure the string is safe from XSS point of view. There's a similar function which is called uh, filter XSS admin, which is, can be handy for module development. So if you want the administrators to be able to input almost any HTML tag, but not unsafe tags like script tags, you can use that and it will basically allow almost everything through, uh, but still keep you safe. I, I think it will remove attributes and stuff like it that. It will remove yeah. some attributes, remove some things, but yeah, it'll allow almost any, you know, basic markup through. Yeah, and in the end, uh, the last case is trusted. I don't think any user input is trusted. But it might happen, right? So uh, uh, then you do basically nothing. Well, yeah, and the example of trusted input is the site administrator you know, needs to have a full HTML node so they can embed a video which has you know, object tags and other things that are you know, basically equivalent to JavaScript. Um, so clearly you know, that user has to be trusted. They have to trust uh, the code, the tags they're pasting in there. Um, you know, and at that point, it's really up to human judgment. Yeah, and, but I still think that's, that's, that shouldn't be an implicit trust because then it should be check markup. And the check markup should decide, well, this is an embed code, so it should be, or this field is embed code, so it's a full HTML, and then decides to do nothing, for example. So what's very important is um, we are all trying to make uh, Drupal multilingual. Uh, so what about localization? And that's really important for a couple of reasons. Um, so you probably know the function called T where, that you use when you need to translate some string. Um, and obviously you shouldn't put any user input into the T function because not only it will not be protected about cross-site scripting, but also the user input can be random, it can be anything. Which means every time you run the function it will generate a new string to be translated. Which means you just cannot translate anything. Like uh, a perfect example is uh, under every notes title submitted by username, right? And you want the submitted by to be, tran uh, to be translatable, but not the username, obviously. So if you just do t submitted by and the variable username, then every time there's a new user that creates a blog post, something like that, it will create a new string and you will never be able to translate it. 
So that's why, again, in T-Function, you use placeholders. And these placeholders are designed to protect you from cross-site scripting. So the first one with the, uh, with the add variable uh, means that it is a plain text. So basically, Drupal will run check plain on the variable. The second one with the percentage is, again, plain text. It will run check plain. But for some reason, it will also the add emphasis tags around the text. And the last one with the, with the exclamation mark is very important because that's HTML. That basically tells Drupal when you do exclamation mark variable to just pass it through. So this is not safe. So the last one is another safe example. And when you use that, then you're not protecting yourself against precise scripting. So let's talk cross-site request forgery. And that's, um, I think that's an important one. But at the same time, it's, it's usually very hard to grasp it. And most of the people actually don't know what it means. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you understand it, you'll see that it's throughout Drupal. And it's actually very easy. So what it means is uh, some action is taken without user confirmation. So imagine that you have some non-Drupal site, example.com slash admin slash delete PHP, ID equals one, two, three. What this is supposed to do is whenever you go to this URL, it will delete the node with ID one, two, three. It's a non-Drupal example. Uh, and there's no confirmation, you know. So imagine what happens if you actually take this whole URL and put it into image source tag and put it on the same website. And then you take a look at the website and you force the administrator to access the website somehow. And that's the easy part. You just post it. You post the link on, I don't know, Facebook or something like that. And the administrator, who's usually logged into the site, because frankly, not very often you log out of Drupal site, right? So the administrator goes to his site. He's logged in. He goes to this URL. And there's an image source tag. And his browser will just load the image with the delete PHP URL. And it will run the action that's in the delete PHP, which means he doesn't know any about anything, but he just deleted some node, for example. And that's just, again, a very simple example. We'll show you. Peter has a great demo where we'll show you what exactly you can do with cross-site request forgery. Uh, what's very important is that both get and post can be used for cross-site request forgery. So the get part is what I've shown you right now, and that's the easy part. But actually, post is not protecting you as well, because you can very easily post forms with JavaScript. How to protect against this? Um, if you take a look, if you just use Drupal and use Forms API, you're done. Because Forms API does all of this for you. Um, and maybe you have noticed that if you view source of some Drupal page and there's a form, there's a hidden field called form token. Have you noticed that before? Great. And it's annoying, right? Because then you reload the page and it says validation error, try again. Or you something. log out in a second. Yeah. Uh, and that's very annoying if you log out and log in again and you still keep the form. And the form token is actually the cross-site request forgery protection. And that, that token depends on your session. So that's why if you log out in one tab and submit the form in the other tab, it's going to give you a, a validation error. Yeah. Because the session is no longer the same. Exactly. So how does this work? Um, let's say, imagine that you have a browser. And the browser loads the form from the user. And as part of the form, the application, in this case Drupal, will send this unique token, the form token, in the form. And once this user submits the form, it will do a post back to Drupal. And as part of that, it will contain the, the same token. And what Drupal will do is basically compare the token it knows, because it, once it loads, uh, when it, once it sends the token, it will also remember it for your session. And once you, say, once you send the page back, it will compare those two, the remembered value and the value they receive, the, the Drupal application received. If they are equal, then it will allow the action. If they are not equal, then it will not allow the action. It's very easy. And just to illustrate how this works, and this is also uh, how to do this if you're not using Forms API, for example, for GET requests. So you need to do it manually. And a good example is flag module. You probably know flag module. And if you want to flag something, there's a crazy unique string in every URL. And that's the token. So what flag module does is 
when it displays the URL, it will call a function Drupal gets token with some kind of random string, or not random, string that's unique for this kind of operation. And it will get a token string and put it as part of the URL. And once you click on the URL, it will go back to Drupal and flag module will do a very simple thing. It will say, if Drupal valid token, that's a function, the received token and the unique string I talked about, then perform the action. If not, then don't do anything. And that's a very easy way how to protect against cross-site request forgery uh, if you're using get request. So let's talk about, very quickly, uh, my favorite PHP filter, and I think it's just a simple fail. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't be using PHP filter on your website, no matter what I've seen in my life maybe one example where it makes sense. And I've seen a couple of horrible examples where Drupal prog or Drupal program, um, pseudo programmer didn't know Drupal APIs, didn't know modules. So a whole business application that was generating a lot of revenue was written as a node. It was basically a node with PHP filter and the whole application was part of the node. That's good, you know, uh, but it works for them. Um, and it's bad for security, but at the same time, it's also bad for speed. Because once you have PHP filter on, uh, once you write PHP code in your filter in your node body, for example, that code cannot be run using APC caching. So it will be slow because it will have to be evaled every time you run the code. And it will also can't be cached by Drupal's paid cache. Yes. So, definitely not PHP filter. So at this time, I'll uh, give the microphone to Peter. And what we will do is uh, talk a bit more about those two examples of cross-site scripting and actually show you a demo how it works. So just a uh, point we wanted to emphasize again, um, it doesn't matter how secure your code is, if you let someone configure your site badly, uh, as Jake Jacob mentioned, the PHP filter and the full HTML. Basically, if you allow untrusted users or even worse, anonymous users access to those, they can take over your site with essentially zero effort. And um, as an exercise, we've done things like typing in certain strings into Google that show up in those filters. And you can find people's Drupal sites that are exposed this way. <laughs> and you know, if you're really nice, you, you put in a little PHP snippet that sends them an email warning them that their site's insecure. Um, but again, so, you know, bad config um, means an insecure site. And just think about it, you know, the people in your organization, if Joe in marketing, you know, this happy guy can misconfigure your site and let anonymous users use full HTML, nothing else that we're talking about here matters. Your site is insecure and it's gonna be hacked. So that's a take home message, you know, that's sort of beyond the code level, uh, but it's really important when you're managing a Drupal site. Um, so another sort of Getting back to sort of the developer level, um, we mentioned again the importance of the theme layer in protecting especially custom sites. And so something I just wanna talk a little bit here is if you're doing custom development and you have developers and themers working together on the same site, uh, you need to have kind of an understanding between them to achieve the harmony to keep your site safe. Um, and in particular, as a developer, it's sort of your responsibility to understand the data. You need to know whether it's user input, whether it's unsafe, and how to make it safe. The themer often, that's not their responsibility. Their responsibility is markup, their responsibility is printing things out, um, getting to show on the page. And so if you deliver to them unsafe, unfiltered user content, uh, that's when these sorts of mistakes happen that expose the site to cross-site scripting. Um, so in general, for modules, um, you should be looking to use pre-process functions so that's basically a function that runs before a theme template or in Drupal 7 also between a before a theme function. And that allows the module developer to alter the data between when it came in basically to the, to the original function call and when it gets delivered to either the template or the theme function. And you take that opportunity and you can redefine the variables or you can filter them and make them safe so the themer can use them directly without having to know anything more about where it came from. Um, once the themer gets that variable in the template, then they'll just be free to print it. Or in Drupal 7, sometimes you also use this function called render. So you'll print render the variable if it's a, a renderable uh, data structure. 
Uh, so that's very important. So if you're a developer, think about the fact you need to give the themers uh, safe data. You need to give them instructions, for example, in the template, put code comments saying, here are the safe variables. These are the ones you should be using. Um, so an example of Drupal core of this kind of preprocess function here in the book module, and you can see that the book title variable is being populated, and that's being populated from the book link, link title, uh, which is user input. That, I think, originally comes, for, for example, from the no title. And so here we're calling check plain. Um, you know, we're making it safe, we're making it plain text. So the themer can then use it safely and without any uh, concerns. Um, so just repeating this point, if JavaScript can do something, if you can do something and, the Java, and JavaScript runs on your site, it can also do everything you can do and possibly more because it's faster and you know, can do it algorithm, algorithmically. Um, yeah, so protect yourself and think about again, if you're developing a custom site, your theme is where you should be spending a lot of your time auditing the code uh, for cross-site scripting holes. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little example now of what cross-site scripting can do and why uh, it can be so dangerous. And this example, um, what I've done is I installed open Atrium version 1.2, which might still be the current release or the last release, um, more or less current release. Um, and that has in it uh, the Rubik theme shipped. And I've reconfigured it. So Rubik is not the default administrative theme, uh, but Rubik has a security vulnerability. It was a beta release of the theme. So that's a publicly known vulnerability. If you have Rubik theme, Rubik configured as your administration theme, you're potentially vulnerable to this uh, right now. Um, and what happens is in Rubik theme in certain paths, uh, it takes part of the URL the path, it's expecting a Drupal path, something safe, and it, it puts it in the class of the node body, or the page body. So it looks at the path, it expects like, you know, admin config, and it puts, you know, it's imagining that you want to use, let's say, you know, config as a class in your CSS. Well, instead, what I can do is I can put some JavaScript in that URL, and the JavaScript will then get injected into the body tag and execute on the page, and now we have our cross-site scripting attack. So I'll uh, talk you through this. It's a lot of fun. So here I'm on the hacker site. The hacker's setting up a trap uh, for our, our administrator. And so if the query string says sucker like that, it will then inject this iframe. The iframe is only zero pixels high, so you can't see it. And it will load the script called b.js. Um, and in the next tab, I'll show you this b.js. This is a uh, Greg updated this for Drupal 6. This is basically it, a JavaScript that will edit your user, user one account and change the name and password to hacked. Now, clearly, if you were actually attacking someone, you wouldn't change the name since you wouldn't want them to see it, but it's great for demo purposes. So you can see that dramatic change in the username of user one. So imagine, you know, so here's my site. I'm user one, Peter. Uh, everything looks good. Now, someone on Drupal.org sent me a contact message about a great blog post that I might want to see. All right, and you notice the uh, query string there? Okay, now I've gone to the page. I don't see anything. Everything looks fine. Uh, oh, except it was submitted by evil guy. That's, uh, that's not good. <laughs> now if I reload the page, what happened? My account has been hacked, right? That JavaScript ran, edited my account, changed my password, and changed my username just by loading that page. So let's just, so we can see that in a little more detail, uh, we'll load the web console. This is a little hard to see, but uh, you can uh, watch the stream of requests going as I reload the page. And you'll see right at the top there, there's a really long request where that iframe is loaded. And then down below, there's a post request where it's sending the form and editing my user account. Yeah, so we mentioned that cross-site scripting is not limited to get Right, so a side note, this, this kind of attack is called a reflected cross-site scripting attack. So the JavaScript wasn't stored on the site, it was injected through the URL and then reflected onto the user. Uh, the more common one, so Jakob talked earlier about node title, that would be a stored uh, cross-site scripting request where it's just stored permanently in the database and it's gonna attack the user every time they load uh, the page displaying that node title. Um, the distinction isn't really important because they both have the same effect, but it's important to know any kind of cross-site scripting attack uh, can lead to your site being compromised. 
Um, refreshing again, cross-site request forgery. This is the other kind of attack. Um, this is where you don't have something like a form token to protect you. So in that example, previous example, because of the same origin policy, that JavaScript was able to steal the form token from my site, from the form, and resubmit it and have it execute. If there's a cross-site attack, the JavaScript doesn't have access to things like the form token. It can't uh, pretend to be me, so it has to rely on the fact that there's a URL that takes an action without requiring some kind of form token. So, you know, just an e easy example, you know, the evil hacker causes you a redirect in your browser and just sends you to a URL that takes some action and deletes a node, unpublishes content, blocks a user. You can imagine that a lot of developers, as they start uh, developing, they think, hey, I want a one-click uh, link that's going to take this action. Uh, if you're thinking to yourself, I want to click a link and take an action, you need to have a form token uh, protecting that. And we've seen this kind of vulnerability, for example, in voting modules, uh, where people could have, uh, for example, voted behalf on someone else and voted nodes up or down. Um, the example I want to show you is from the views UI module. Uh, so this vulnerability was actually fixed in 2010, so it's, you know, should be well out of the public realm of anyone who keeps their site up to date. Um, but what happened is that the views UI module uh, did not have a token protection um, when disabling a view. And what I've done is I went back and I found the patch that fixed this vulnerability, and I reversed the patch on this same open atrium install so we could see what happens in this attack, you know, that was present in the views module in 2010. So again, we're in open atrium. And one thing I want to show you, if you look at something like a view, oftentimes the machine name is exposed in the HTML classes. So if you look at the page source, you can uh, potentially intuit the machine name without even having administrative access to the site. So I can set up my attack potentially by just being a user of the site, not being an administrator. So we're back on my evil site, as Jacob, Jacob said, uh, you can use an image tag here. So we have an image tag whose source is to disable this view. Okay, so we're set up with our attack, and again, you know, so this is a blog, it has some pictures, imagine I'm the administrator and I'm just attracted, I see, um, you know, somewhere listening to this blog post with pictures. Um, and my site was fine, my homepage has the view on it. When I go um, and look at this click through into this blog post, again submitted by our friend Evil Guy, um, all we see is some images load. Uh, we don't see that image tag that linked back to my site, but if I go to my site and reload, what happened? My home page is now blank. My view is gone, it's disabled. So as you know, a lot of sites are built with views. You could imagine that this could have been a pretty devastating attack against someone's site who was, you know, constructed of views. Their home page would have been blank. Uh, they could, you know, users couldn't have found the content they're looking for. Um, it wouldn't have destroyed the site, but it would have been a real inconvenience and would have been a real black mark and an obvious, you know, problem with your site. Uh, for all your users. Um, and so we talked about that it's actually pretty easy to force the user to visit the URL, and it doesn't have to be anything very complicated, right? Um, if I now tweet, hey, check these, these slides from this security presentation off of your Republic, click the link, and it can be some tiny URL, and it will expand to the attack, and you will know. So we're kind of... Uh, wrapping up here, and then we should have some time for questions. Um, uh, but we kind of wanted to get back to things. So the, you know, the two big things that, as Drupal developers, you know, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, those are the vulnerabilities you most often see, um, especially in the theme layer, cross-site scripting, holes and custom themes. Um, there are other uh, topics you should be aware of, um, and I just want to run through them real quickly. So one of them is access bypass. Uh, so you'll see some security advisories talk about access bypass. That's something like uh, where a user, a site has a node access module, the user's not supposed to see content, um, but there's a flaw in some other module, and ex for example, it has a block listing nodes. And so this private content is listed even though the user shouldn't have access to it. Um, someone before the talk uh, suggested also I talked about caching. And if you use, especially some kind of custom caching implementation, you can run into the same problem. So for example, if you, if an administrator views a page and it's cached, and the cache doesn't properly uh, key by role, user role, then some other user might view the same page, an anonymous user even, 
and see all the content that the administrator could see. So that's another kind of access bypass. It could be through caching, it could be through mistakes in logic, and it could be you know, through failure to use Drupal APIs. Um, uh, another example of something that we see once in a while is um, uh, file inclusion or uh, which can lead to a code execution. And this is basically the same as PHP filter. Right, so a file is loaded and any PHP code inside it is run. Um, now, again, the, the attacks this way can be pretty interesting. So for example, your access log, you know, your Apache access log, well, the user can construct a very long URL that goes into your Apache access log. If they can then cause your Drupal site to include the access log as a PHP file, they may be able to execute the PHP code that they've saved into your access log as a log entry. Right, so again, this, this may not sound like something feasible, but this is a sort of attack that does actually happen. Um, another uh, example of a sort of slightly more exotic but, but dangerous attack is directory traversal. And this is again where um, we may be able to include as content in the page uh, a file that the user is not supposed to see. Um, so the classic example for Drupal is if they can see your settings.php file, they could get your database credentials, and depending on your server setup, um, they could then connect to your database. So directory traversal often is if you don't escape things like slashes and dots, that can um, let be put into the URL, and you know if you're looking, for example, for a template file based on the URL, you may be misled and, and load the long, wrong file. Uh, finally, just a note on tools. There are a lot of good tools you should be using. You should be connecting to servers using secure shell, using secure FTP. Older tools like unencrypted FTP really should be left by the wayside. If you're still using those tools, it's time to update your tool chain um, and use secure tools. And especially for SSH, the best practice is not to use passwords at all. You can use key-based login, um, and that basically totally prevents um, brute force attacks on your server. So if, again, if you're running a server, you should be using SSH, you should be using key-based login. Not something we can really get into detail here, but I just want to place that idea in your mind. Go think about it. If you're, if you're in that situation and you're not saying, yes, we do that already, then you should be going back and reviewing um, your practices. The, the concept is that when you're using SSH uh, as keys, it's not only something you know, which is a password, but it's also something that you have, that you own, and that's the key. So it's basically two layers of security. Um, and just to revisit access bypass again, so in Drupal 6, if you're doing a node query, you may remember or have used DB rewrite SQL. So in Drupal 6, this is an important function. It makes sure that node access is respected uh, when you're listing nodes. In Drupal 7, the, the database layer has changed a little bit, and instead of writing, wrapping your query in a rewrite function, instead you tag the query. And so the tag is the node access query, and this ends up having the same effect. So in Drupal 7, tag the query as being relevant for node access so that it will be filtered uh, for the current user's node access. In Drupal 6, uh, use DB rewrite SQL. Um, we'll, of, post, of course, post these slides, but there's a lot of resources you should be aware of. Um, if you're talking to someone about Drupal and whether Drupal is secure, the Drupal Security Report is a great white paper. Um, that kind of covers a lot of these things at a high level. Uh, talks about Drupal's approaches, why it's secure, what the Drupal process is. Uh, that's a great thing for you to have, especially if you're trying to sell Drupal uh, to a client. Um, on Drupal.org, we have documentation pages about writing secure code, also documentation about secure configuration for your Drupal site. Um, there's a whole site dedicated to hacking and preventing hacks of Drupal called Cracking Drupal. Uh, there's a corresponding book uh, written by Greg here in the front who would be happy, I'm sure, to sign it if uh, you buy one. <laughs> Um, so, you know, he has blog posts there, um, as well as a lot of good material. Um, and uh, Heine, who's the former head of the Drupal security team, has his own blog post where he's put up a number of interesting uh, discussions and uh, investigations into Drupal security. And finally, there are two Drupal modules that will help you review your code. So if you're writing code and you feel uncertain and think you might have made some kind of basic mistake, uh, you know, take a look at the security review module or the coder module and those will run some basic checks on your code and make sure that you haven't made any of the most common or critical mistakes. Um, last, before uh, we finish, um, at Acquia, um, 
we have two uh, usability experts, uh, Lisa and Darmesh, and they're trying to do uh, user experience studies for Drupal. If you're willing to help improve Drupal's user experience, it would be great if you could get in touch with them. Um, particularly, I assume most people in this room are site builders or developers, so contact Lisa Rex, um, either at Lisa Rex or Lisa.rex at Acquia. Um, it would be really great if you'd be willing to just sit down and do 10 minutes of your time and make Drupal better. Um, so with that, thank you. Please evaluate the session. The direct link is there, node 1324. Um, and if anyone has uh, questions, we have uh, you know, five minutes or so for questions. Uh, feel free to use the microphone. Thank you. I had a quick question. I remember a public service announcement recently about security reviews of dev and alpha releases. And I'm wondering if you have any comments about under what circumstances is it acceptable to use a dev or an alpha release in production? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the rare person who has the luxury of not ever using a dev or alpha release. Exactly. Um, so I think at some level, though, you have a higher responsibility to look at the code. Um, you need to be aware that if there's a vulnerability, it's going to be publicly announced, potentially right away. So you're not going to be protected. The security team often um, will work with the maintainer and make sure that there's a fix available before the security vulnerability is made public. But at Dev or Alpha release, the vulnerability will be made public before there's a, a, a fix. Um, so you, you know, potentially need to be prepared to get involved if this is an important module for you and that happened. Um, you need to be able to evaluate whether that affects you. You know, it basically just means you have to be more involved, pay more attention. I, you know, I'm not going to say don't do it, but you know, the whole process we have set up is you know, really for fully released modules. I think the flip side of that is if there's a module that's important to you that's not fully released, you should be working with the maintainer and encourage them to get it to 1.0 so that you know, they can take part in this full uh, yeah, security release process. I think it's also a security awareness, basically, that we should, you all or all of us who are Drupal module developers should be really releasing stable versions. It's not like if you do only beta version or alpha version, you're protecting yourself from all the security team that's coming to you. You're actually, if you do stable release, you're protecting your users because we all do mistakes. And if you do a mistake in a stable release, everybody will know about it and it will be fixed. If you do a mistake in an alpha version, it will be public. Hi, uh, I, I work with a lot of designers who, uh, for example, in blocks, they like to use PHP filters. Uh -huh. So I, I understand from a pro programmer's perspective um, how I would do it, you know, via custom module, make sure all the user input is filtered. Uh, but what, would you recommend me just going to them and telling them, stop doing that, you need to come to me to create a custom module with anything, any user input? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, and, and it is an evolutionary process. At one point, Drupal.org had pages and blocks that were PHP. And, you know, as in a drive to make Drupal.org secure, all those were moved to modules. You know, and maybe you can tell them they could, they could, you know, prototype it on their local site and give you that PHP code. And then, you know, they prototype that they know it would work. And then you can incorporate it in a module and, you know, double check it. But, you know, they shouldn't be putting PHP on the live site. You want to be secure. Yeah, that was essentially my question. I was just wondering if there's any been any way discovered to essentially sandbox or chroot uh, PHP code so that it can't um, access the rest of the site. Basically, run it locally. Run it, you know, in a development environment. There's okay. no. Yeah, I mean, once it's on your Drupal site, it has full access to everything in I your Drupal it's database. Uh, yeah, I was wondering. Um, do you guys have a response ready for? Um, <coughs> the cross-site request forgeries in uh, 7.12. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, do you guys have uh, any kind of response for um, the cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities in uh, Drupal uh, 7.12? Right. Um, Greg, do you want to cover it? 7.12. Which which bogus. are the that's the uh, reports stable. about the uh, form tokens and sessions? Yep, form tokens and yeah. uh, HTTP refers. Do you want to cover it? Yeah, the response is actually documented on groupsdrupal.org. Okay. Basically, the response is that we don't feel it's a valid report. 
Okay. It's not a, it's, no, we don't feel, it is not a valid report. Okay. So you just gr uh, take a look at groups, Drupal.org. I think it's a group called security. Best practices in security and it's documented uh, what the response is. Cool, thank you. So, so the one the one concern I always get from um, from clients is, well, surely we can put images in in um, uh, in a node, right? Just just in line. Um, do, do do you guys have? Is there a good place where there's an example of why uh, allowing inline images can be insecure? Or I'm, I'm just uh, you mean why not put in images into? Well, notes or well yeah. so there's, there's a couple things. So who, who is posting that content, I think, is the, the most important question. It, so it, it's users at, 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 the, uh, at, at the organization, but in some cases right. they it, are a lot are, of Are they trusted users? Um, most of them are trusted, but so they well, are I mean, planning on allowing. <laughs> right. So I, I think part of it is, you know, uh, whether or not you trust the users, in part because, you know, as, in the example, you could see you can use an image tag you know, to run a cross-site request forgery attack. And so if the users weren't trusted, especially if they're anonymous, you know, there's a risk that they'll, they'll post such a, you know, if there was a vulnerability on your site, they could post that image tag on your site in some place your administrators are likely to visit. And that would mean that your administrators are likely to be attacked. And um, I think that you need to understand that cross-site re request forgery is not about image tags, okay? You can find other ways how to do that. You can right. use fire iframes, you know, just direct URL using tiny URL or something like that. Right. So potentially you can use, you can allow your users to put image tags into your content, but it needs to be part of image, uh, filtered HTML filter. So you filter anything that's dangerous, basically. So, so the image it, tag it's is it's not the important part. Yeah. Okay, so, so adding, add, so adding it, because I know by default ima the image tag isn't, isn't right. in the filtered HTML. So you're saying right. that if you put it in the filtered HTML, but then also. Well, so if, are you allowing anonymous or untrusted users to post this content? That's the question for you. The, the uh, untrusted users will be allowed in a future phase, yeah. So then you need to take some action and not allow them to post image tags blindly. And you can look at what Drupal.org just did, which is it, I'm not sure where the code for this is, but it actually checks that the image tags are referencing an image on the same site. Okay. And Thank that's you. why Drupal.org um, recently allowed image tag images to be posted by every user, whereas for many years it was limited to only more trusted roles on Drupal.org because that extra protection has been added in there. Um, so again, you might think about a strategy like that. If you need um, untrusted users to be able to post images, you need to you know, take some additional steps. And I think uh, the image, uh, the module is like image filter or something like that. But there's also a module that's pretty handy called path filter. Image uh, filter and, and path filter? Okay. Yeah, I think so. If, I think it's path filter. And it's pretty cool because it also does other stuff like uh, making sure that uh, sometimes when you do, uh, when you develop content on your development environment, users will put absolute URLs into the links, right? Mm -hmm. And then the code when you, or the content when you put it live will reference the development environment. And path filter can make sure that all these uh, URLs are not absolute, but relative, for example. Per thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And please remember to rate the session. We are interested in your feedback.